So let's get started. Welcome back. Uh, today we're looking at network programming. It's our topic for today and I have some examples for you to combine network programming with a swing and AWT stuff that we covered last time. Um, so what I want to do is kind of hit the lecture material first and then show you some examples second. So you can kind of see the concepts put into place. And uh, so this is lecture nine. And uh, what do we look at in terms of network programming? Well, these days the network is the internet. So we can go and get URLs. We can process information on the internet within our uh, Java application that we're writing. And so this is how we're going to do it. And so this lecture is all about connecting to the internet, looking at um, URLs and how to incorporate that. Um, we can actually write a pretty nice, uh, we're not, I'm not going to show you an example of it, I'm going to show you a text editor example, but you can actually write a pretty nice web browser, real easily actually, and I'll show you how that's done today. Um, but it all starts out with uh, this concept of the URL, and the URL is the acronym for Unified Resource Locator, so you learn that, probably everybody knows that already, because you've, unless you just crawled up from under a rock, you've probably been using the internet for a very long time so far. And uh, But uh, technically that's what it's called, the URL. And so it's a resource locator, which means it can get files, Word files, PowerPoint files, HTTP compatible, HTML files. Um, so it depends on what you're getting. It's all done the same way. So the sample structure of the URL is the resource name part, which contains the host name, the file, the portion, the option. And this is kind of a review of the concept. It's really an HTTP protocol. And HTTP is actually a protocol that runs on top of IP, Internet Protocol. And uh, we just kind of take it for granted, I think, sometimes. You know, we use web browsers in general. But um, the concept is uh, it's nothing more. The web browser is nothing more than a text editor, if you think about it. Or a, not even a text editor. It's a notepad. It's a viewer, a text viewer. It views text. And uh, usually there's a conversion to make it HTML compatible. So it'll read the tags and convert the tags. So what it is is, uh, and, you know, the web browser itself is nothing more than uh, reads a file, parses out the code, turns the HTTP or turns the HTML tags into formatting, and displays the content for you. So I'm going to show you how to actually bring up a page, but it's going to be shown in text. I'm not going to do any of the HT HTML conversion for you. And then there's a third, there's a ton of third-party libraries out there, and there's a ton of uh, source code examples for Java. So you can create a URL object in your Java application from the absolute URL or the relative URL. The absolute URL and the relative one, the absolute is going to be the full URL. The relative is going to be you know, from within a particular directory uh, or from within a particular location. So the URL class, and there is a URL class, provides several different methods for implementing uh, UML objects. So you can create a UML object and then tell, go, go, tell the object to go get it, go get whatever's out there. And so you can get the protocol, host name, port name, file name from the URL. And here's an example of how we would do it. And we're going to import a new class here. It's going to be java.net, excuse me, a new package. So import java.net. All of the networking facilities are inside of here. This is for IO. Uh, yeah, we've actually kind of seen it already, I think. So we're going to create this public class parse URL. I'm going to show you this code out in an Eclipse example as soon as I get done with the PowerPoint. Uh, but for the purposes of what we're looking at, we're throwing an exception. The throwing in the exception is going to catch the I/O exception um, or the network exception, depending upon what we're going to what we're going to look at. And uh, here, what we're going to do is say the URL a URL. So we're creating a URL object, and the URL object is part of .NET, uh, Java.NET. And uh, we're going to call it a URL. It's going to be a new URL, and we just simply give it the URL. So it's as simple as using a web browser. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> you know, all I have to do is another URL. This URL here is for a. Um, looks like it, it's for from a book. It's from a, actually a Java Sun book, um, where uh, it's using port 80. And this would normally just be replaced with you know something like www.google.com or something. You know, whatever the URL happens to be. And then now uh, we're going to print something out to the screen. And what we're going to print out is we're going to, from this a URL object that we've created, which is an object, uh, an instance of the URL object, we can run the methods 
because the object actually includes all of the method, pro you know, such as the protocol, the host, the file, the port, the reference. I really didn't go through, you know, all of the different parts of the URL with you, uh, but if you take a, you know, an HTML class or you take a web development, or you probably know this already, you know, there's there's a port, you know, and there, there, excuse me, in this, in this case it's actually port 80. Uh, there's going to be a file, perhaps. There's going to be a, a file. You know, there's going to be a host. You know, it's Google or something. And here, the host is uh, Java.sun, and uh, it's port 80. And uh, we've got the file here, H index.html, downloading. Um, so we can actually get it and run the methods to get at. And actually, here we have it. Here's here's the output right here. Actually, the protocol is HTTP. It's always going to come back HTTP. There's I don't know if there's really a, a big use for get protocol outside of maybe um, you're running a, a networking application and you're doing some FTP, some telnetting, and some HTTP, which are all three different types of protocols. And you want to say, well, what protocol is the user trying to use? And then bring up maybe a dialog or maybe a box or a window that is more compatible with the protocol, perhaps. So, so we can tell what the user is doing with these URL objects, perhaps, and you know, try to determine something by the information we're getting. So this is just an example of how to run the built-in methods. And there's nothing that the programmer has to create. We just create an instance of this URL, and then we have it. And we can just go get stuff off the Internet. So that is about as easy as it gets. If you're a C++ programmer from the old days, it was a lot more difficult. You had to create a socket, and we had to bind a socket to a port. You know, we had to do a lot more. This is just extremely simple. So Connecting with a URL. So we have an open stream which returns the Java I/O input stream. We actually covered uh, I/O streams. We actually covered the Java.io package a couple weeks back, um, and the input stream object. Um, so it actually opens one up and uses the input stream object, so we can read and write to the stream. So we could take that stream that's coming in from the URL. Let's say we didn't download a file. Let's say maybe perhaps we went to www.google.com. We can take that stream and parse it and apply the HTML elements to it. So if it, we see a bold tag, make it bold, you know, which is what a br web browser is actually doing. So here's an example here, uh, which we're going to read. Uh, we're going to easily read, um, can read easily as reading from an input stream, and it can throw an I.O. exception if there's nothing there. So if it's a bad URL, you get the wrong address, can't read it or something, it, it's going to throw the exception for you. So here's a way of taking and uh, instead of just running the method calls to see what we've got, we're going to do the same code over again. It's going to be read URL, and uh, in the main we're going to throw an exception, and the exception is going to be an I/O exception that's going to be thrown. And we're going to say URL space uh, OSU, and uh, it's going to be equal to a new URL. And here we're going to run the ITU. We're going to come to the ITU website. So I've mixed and matched schools. This is Oregon State University and this is ITU. <laughs> so <laughs> being fair to different schools here. Uh, so the URL object is going to read this. And we're going to create a buffer reader in. This is the instance of the buffer reader object that's coming from I.O. It's going to be a new buffer reader. It's going to be a new buffer reader. For this object here, we're going to open the stream. And then we're running a method that's already on this URL to open the stream. So open stream is the universal way of just saying, give me everything there. Open it up, give it to me. And then now we're going to create a string uh, input line. And then while the input line is equal to in.read line, which is what we went over a couple weeks ago in terms of the buffer, uh, buffer reader. We created a buffer reader instance in in.read line. While it's not null, which means we're at the end of the file, uh, print it out. So this is going to print it out, and this is the example, uh, a similar one, that I'm going to show you uh, today when we get done with the lecture. And uh, this prints out the source of the web page. It's going to print it out in text It's going to because it's just reading it line by line. So you're going to get, and if, if we do this, in fact, we'll do it with itu.edu, and we'll see what prints to the screen. And it's kind of like the, uh, the option in the web browser to view as text, or to view the source, because what you're going to be seeing is the source instead of the HTML output. So a web browser in concept just reads it in, takes it, and translates it to HTML, you know, converts to HTML. So we also have an open connection method that we can run on this URL, which returns a URL connection object that represents the connection to the remote object that's referred to by the URL, and it throws an I/O exception as well. So here we're going to do a 
try, and then it's going to be a URL OSU. Is going to, you know, we're going to call this object OSU again. It's going to be equal to a new URL, and uh, it's going to be itu.edu website. So the UR connection, we're going to call it an OSU connection, is going to be equal to the OSU dot open connection. We're running the method to open the connection, and then here's our error checking part in terms of our um, I.O. exception that might happen. A malformed URL exception might be thrown, URL failed, or, you know, and then we're going to essentially catch any I.O. exception that might exist. So the URL connection class provides many methods to communicate with the URL, such as reading and writing. The connection uh, can be used for other purposes, um, but it's a generic way to say open the connection instead of open the stream. Because we can, what we can do is we can go out and get something and return it. And that would be an HTTP protocol, and that would be the stream input that we're getting from that particular location. Or we can open something and write something to that location, or read something from that location without looking at a particular file, without looking at a particular object that we're getting. So when we open the connection, we're going to close the connection. But when we open the connection, we leave it open. So we're there communicating. So the resources are slightly different, or the use of the resource is slightly different. We also have sockets in Java. As I mentioned before, if you're in C++, you're using sockets for everything, even URLs. So we have built-in networking classes, but then we also have the other way of doing it, the more manual approach. For creating a client-server application, for example, we would use sockets. We would create a host, and we would create a client, or we call it a server and a client, and the server would open up a socket, sit there, wait on a port, and uh, sockets are bound to ports, and the socket is the software abstraction for the communication. All computers have ports, which is the interesting thing. In fact, there's an unlimited number of ports, and uh, depending upon, you know, your network system, whether you're behind a firewall, whether your router is blocking ports, you may not necessarily do be able to create a client-server application that uh, connects client to server through a router. That might not be possible. But if you're on the same network, if you are, if you have two computers and you're um, behind the firewall and you're on the same network, easy way to do this would be to write a client and write a server. And this would be using a socket. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Socket abstraction. And then you tell this client to connect to the server on this port, and you have the server listen to a port. And then you've got a direct communication going back and forth. You can send and receive text, streams of information, send and receive files, and uh, it's peer-to-peer -peer networking, essentially. Uh, well, it's really client-server networking, because you can take many different clients, connect it. So if you think of the concept, um, the Apache server <laughs> is a client server environment as well. And uh, Apache Server is this software you're buying, open, not buying, it's open source, it's free. You can download it. In fact, if you have a MacBook, you already have Apache on your, you already have Apache capabilities. All you have to do is open up port 80. Um, because by default, it's restricted, it's closed. So you open the port. Opening the port just says the router, accept traffic. Let traffic come through that port and so we can access my computer. Biggest problem with people who try to put together their own web servers or their own client server programs is they forget about the security. They forget about the ports being closed. And then you can go from your computer to your computer. It works just fine. In fact, you can uh, load it on, 80, on port 80 and access it, which is kind of the default for HTTP protocol to begin with, and access it from your computer to your computer and just go into your web browser and you can see everything that's on your server on your local computer, but then there's problems when other people outside try to access you. And when they try to come through your, your firewall or your router, which is going to have the firewall, and it's going to block that port. They're going to get an error message. Uh, but in theory, this is simple. You know, minus all of the security features, <laughs> this is quite simple to establish. So sometimes you need a low-level network communication, such as a client-server application. Client server applications in Java, piece of cake. So the TCP protocol provides a reliable port-to-port -port communication channel via the socket. The socket is a software-level abstraction. The sockets don't exist on your computer. Uh, that's one of the main confusing parts as students when they start looking at, what is a socket? There's no sockets on your computer. <laughs> you create the socket. It's the object that you're going to create in Java. 
and it's going to bind, and they call it binding because it attaches itself. It listens to a port. You have to give it a port number, and you have to give it a host name for TCP, because TCP IP works with ports and hosts. If you haven't noticed, every one of your computers that you have has a unique IP address on it, because TCP runs over IP. IP is an internet protocol is what that stands for, and it's the I, well, it's the, I was going to say IEEE, but it's not really, it's the um, OSI, Open Systems Interface, compatible IP layer, the transport, well, right, right below transport, right around the transport area, uh, uses transport because TCP is transport. TCP is transport communication protocol. And it's, and a protocol itself by default is just the rules. So it's a set of rules, requirements that programs have to implement in order to communicate across back and forth. The entire network is IP. The entire internet is all IP based. So an IP base gives us our I addressing. So it's IP4 right now. We've got IP6 on the horizon, but right now it's pretty much majority IP4. It gives us a certain URL, which is when I looked at URL in the beginning of this lecture, I showed you a name, I believe, you know, like, or I've been talking about Google. It's really a series of numbers. We have domain name servers out there that resolve those numbers. So it's actually kind of easy to put a web server up on your computer, believe it or not, especially if you have a MacBook, <laughs> because you load Apache on it. Actually, you can load Apache on a Windows machine as well. You install the server, gives you the web server. Well, what's a web server? If you've ever done any web programming, you know, you just upload to a web server, you get an account, you know, you get an ISP, and they, they give you space, and you upload your stuff, and then they give you a URL. Well, it's nothing more than a directory on a computer. So when you load Apache on your computer, you have your own Apache, you have your own server, you have your own directory, and you bind it to port 80. You open up port 80 on your router. You have an IP address because you're running IP. You have to be running IP, otherwise you're not connecting to the internet. Your service provider is providing you with an IP address. You take that IP address, you register for it for free, one of these domain name services, and voila, you have www.behacker.com, which is what I was doing, actually, for a very long time until I got lazy and moved it out to another server because my server broke down last year. But, and then, you know, the other problem is you have to leave it up 24 hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week. Who's going to leave their computer on and maintain it? But you could, essentially, for free, on your computer, set up your own web server. You, know, you have the technology. It doesn't even require that much work, so... And then you can write Java programs if you wanted to, but you can also write Java programs to work with third-party web servers. Um, if you're going to do that, you're using IP and you're using TCP. Um, and it doesn't matter, it really matter what computer you're on, you're always using TCP, whether you're on a Linux, whether you're on a Unix, whether you're on the Windows system. So going back to sockets, sockets is an endpoint for the reliable communication between two machines to connect with each other. Each of the clients and the server binds a socket. Uh, to its end-to-end -end for reading and writing. And uh, the word reliable showed up in here. Reliable communication. Um, interesting, because TCP works with sockets, so does UDP. UDP also works with sockets. And not a bad time to give you a little primer and a little, a little background on TCP and on UDP, just so you, at least when you're doing this stuff in Java, you know what you're doing, hopefully. So there's two, actually there's three, but I'm only going to talk about two of them. On the transport OSI model, there's two that work over IP. There's three that work over IP. The most common are TCP and UDP. TCP, they call it reliable because it's connection-oriented. You actually establish a connection and you keep a connection open between the client and the server. And you exchange messages back and forth. And there's more traffic that occurs that way because... To establish a TCP connection over IP, you bind to a socket, you send something over the socket, and then you wait for an acknowledgement to come back. So it's, you know, hello, I'm the sir, I'm the client, and you ask the server, hello, knock, 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 are you home, server? <laughs> and the server comes back and says, yes, I'm home, I'm here. And then, uh, and I, I always kind of equate it to, well, if you're going to throw a ball across the street and you're going to use TCP, someone's going with the ball. You know how basketball people dribble balls, you know, <laughs> I think they call it dribbling. You know, take this basketball, if you're TCP, the basketball player is going with the ball and is maintaining and is controlling the ball as it goes across the street. And that's connection 
connection oriented. So we have connection less, the opposite of that. Have you ever taken a ball and thrown it across the street? Kicked it across the street? Will it make it? Well, unless a car comes by and hits it in the process. There's a 50-50 chance probably that, I don't know, but you know, you don't know. It's unreliable. So UDP is, is unreliable. Uh, and it's unreliable because it's open up a port, you know, open up a port, connect it to a socket, send a UDP packet over, and then pray that it makes it, because you're never going to get an acknowledgement back. You're not going to get anything back. It's just like tossing the ball across the street and hoping it makes it. Usually it makes it. If it doesn't make it, you just toss another ball across the street. So that, there's no traffic and there's no overhead in terms of the communication going back and forth. It's open it up, close it, open it up, close it. And it's an automatic kind of like, here, send something, send something, send something. Kind of like the way email works. You never have a, you never ever, and the email is a different protocol, it's not UDP, but it's similar. SMTP, you never have a constant connection to that server, ever. <laughs> Although it looks like you do, but every once in a while, you do get a connection. You know, imagine Google, imagine Gmail. Everyone uses Gmail, right? You look like it looks like you have a constant connection, but you don't, because every two or three minutes, and you can set this actually. There's a parameter, and you set it. Your your computer is gonna dial up the Google server and get new mail. Check for new mail, or you can press that little button that says check for new mail, and then it opens it up, checks for mail, delivers the mail, closes it. And there's no more connection. What you're looking at is 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 static. It's not changing. It only changes. It only becomes dynamic when you connect. So for applications like that, it's perfect because, I mean, half your SMTP mail is downloaded. And that's why probably the reason why a lot of people download mobile, mobile apps and things are using it more on the server these days. So it requires you to connect more often. So, but long story short, it's, it's running a similar UDP type of protocol. Um, the UDP in terms of the networking component, it's great when you're sending information. So HTTP sort of runs in a similar type of fashion. And again, just like SMTP, just like UDP, that falls in it. It's a, not a TCP. It's not a constant connection. When you ask for a document from a URL, it goes and gets the document, and then it closes the connection. Although it looks like you're physically connected to something. When you're looking at something on the screen, you're not really connected until you click on something. <laughs> and then you make another request, it goes out, gets something, and brings it back to your computer. In terms of networking, that's the best mode because it doesn't require any overload. It, it doesn't require resources. So servers, are the main problem with servers is how many simultaneous connections can they afford. TCP is expensive because every single TCP connection is a constant connection. You're, only, you're limited to a certain number of clients. Because you're going to run out of ports, or you're going to run out of resources. The client, the server's going to run slow. The server's going to be taken down. Um, so, the way people do a denial of service attacks is they bombard the server, <laughs> hit the server, take. The, it's really actually kind of easy. Uh, well, not as easy as it used to be, because now there's things that will stop the connection, will stop the attack. But in the old days, you could just ping a server constantly for hours, and it would definitely go down eventually. You know. You know, or you know, establish you know, ping it with an established TCP connections to it, and then eventually you're going to overload the server after about an hour or so. And then the server goes down. You go, ah, that's nice. I took the server down. They call that a denial of service because you nobody is able to use it. <laughs> Deny everybody access to it because one guy took it down. But anyway, back to back to the socket abstraction. <laughs> We're getting there eventually. Uh, the TCP is reliable. Uh, it's reliable because of that connection-oriented uh, reading and writing. You open a socket, you establish the TCP connection, it stays constant, and it stays open. And you just use the object, and then you have that constant thing going on. You don't have to connect, disconnect, connect, disconnect. Uh, UDP, uh, by contrast, is run a little bit differently. They both have their pros and cons. Take a networking course. You'll get that information. The Java Net Package provides two classes. We have the socket and the server socket. And it implements the client and the server respectively, which is kind of interesting. In a C or C++, you just have the server, excuse me, you just have the socket. And you create, by creating a state machine or an endless loop, you create the server socket from the socket. 
by telling the socket to continue to listen. Because you can listen, you can read, you can write to the socket. So, or you can wait, which is the listening. So we have five steps in the creation of this, in establishing a simple server. So usually we start out by creating the server first, and then we create the client. And we can have many different instances of the clients running. We only have one of the server. It's classic client server. There's only one server that everybody connects to. So in step number one, we create the server, the server socket object. And just as you might imagine, you just create an instance of it. It's server socket server equal new server socket. And here's the interesting part. We have a port and we need to pass it and a queue length. Well, how long, how many, and this is the interesting thing, it's buffered. So in a CRC++ environment, if you do this, this is why I'm highly promoting Java for client server computing these days. And then at the end, I'll talk about some of the RMI and stuff like that, which is definitely a, a step up from this. This is not remote method invocation. This is this is lower level than that. Um, here we have to say, you know, if we're going to queue up, we're going to buffer the server. We have a built-in facility that says, well, we can, you know, take 10, take 15, take 20, which means if many different clients start sending me messages uh, and I don't catch each one of them individually, I'm going to wait. They're going to be queued up. They're going to be buffered, essentially. And that, that parameter is just telling us how much we're going to buffer uh, because we know if we, we're going to fill up the buffer easily if we have a ton of clients coming in and maybe we don't want that much traffic. So we, we pick something that's going to be, and that takes up resources. So we pick something so we can queue up the messages that are coming in so we can basically capture each one of them. Otherwise, if we get two messages at the same time, we're only going to get one, essentially. We're going to leave it, lose out on messages. So the server listens indefinitely or blocks for an attempt by a client to connect. I don't like to use the word block. I like to use the word listens. It listens, but really when you're listening for something and you're a server, you're not doing anything else. <laughs> you're idle. And then when you find something, when you hear something, something comes in, you accept it, then you start working. So the server is kind of lazy. It just sits there and listens. Someone comes in and says, oh, you want this? Okay, here it is. And you want that? Okay, here it is. And it goes fetches stuff for people. If you're, if you're an HTTP and request coming in, you're just going to be asking for a document and the server is going to give it to you. So the server listens and we have here we have the socket connection is equal to server.accept which says listen, accept a connection. So, And then uh, the third step we get the output or the input stream object uh, that enables us to enables the server to communicate with the client by sending and receiving information, bytes. And this is the same as we did before in the other example actually. Input, stream, input uh, get the input stream or the output get the output stream so because servers send and receive actually so do clients they can send and receive so we have the input and the output stream you can get the stream of other object types from the input stream and output stream as well and then we have the processing phase so we did a server dot accept accept new client connections client connection connects and it says it's a HTTP request, so it's just going to go over to that port 80, and it's going to pick up something. And it's going to take that input stream, and it's going to say, well, what do, you, what do you want? Oh, you want index.html? Okay, here it is. And then it goes, delivers it, sends it back out. Um, so the processing is what's going on. The server and the client communicate via the input stream and the output stream object. It gets the information, and you write the code inside of the program to say, if this is, if it's a URL, that way you can kind of take the object itself and say, well, what is this URL? It wants a file? It doesn't want a connection? It doesn't want to, you know, what does it want? And then you can kind of figure out what information is enclosed in that object. After the communication completes, the server closes the connection and invokes a close on the socket. And the cor corresponding streams are closed as well. So close on the socket closes everything, essentially. When we establish a simple client, we're doing pretty much the same thing, but it's in a slightly different order. So we create a socket object. Instead of a server socket, we create the socket. You could do it. You could do it with a socket connection and not a server socket, but you got to do it manually. Instead of having that wait, <laughs> accept a connection, you got to put a loop in there, and it's not really that. It's not really that effective. Might as well just use a server object a server socket object. Um, but here we have a connection, so it's going to be socket connection. 
I'm going to call the object connection, and it's going to be equal to a new socket. And now we have the server address and ports. So the ports are going to be different for the server and for the client. And the server address is the server that the client wants to connect to. So the server can send or can broadcast or can print the, their own address. Their own address is going to be on the machine that they're on, and they're going through a port. The ports don't have to match, but the port, in fact, they, they can't match. Only one item per port. So let's say we have port 80 listening. Uh, it's on the server. So port 25. No, actually, we don't use 25. Let's not use 80 either. We'll go like 100 is the server, and 50 is the client. And so it says, well, I'm on 50, and I want to go to the server address. Well, that's on 80, so I'm going to go to 192.168.1.523.80, or colon 80. You know, that's where I want to go. You know, and so you have to find where the server's located, get the address, and then the server knows how to get to the client by the port. The client knows how to get to the server by the port, and the sockets keep that information once they establish the connection. So that's why the connection is the most important part. If you don't do the connection properly, you don't get the server address correct, you don't get the port address correct, your whole program doesn't work. <laughs> so the socket's not going to work. So that's the frustrating part. In terms of the server address, you can also use names. You can use host names. So the server address can be a host name or it can be a physical IP address or it can actually be a URL. So the address itself, depending upon where the server happens to be located, is going gonna, is gonna to change. So you get the output stream and the input stream of the socket, and then the server and the client must send and receive the data in the same format, hopefully, which is the same process, and the processing phase is the same. The server and the client communicate via the input stream and the output stream object. After the connection completes, the client closes the connection. So common problem is leaving the connection open. As I mentioned before, the TCP um, is a connection-oriented. You leave it open, and then at one any one one any one point you've connected many times you have 50 connections open it's like do you really need 50 connections open <laughs> if you're lazy and you don't close the connection you make the server run slower essentially so i'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can see this code a little bit easier this is actually runnable code you can cut and paste it type it in i'm going to show you another example i'm not going to show you a server and a client though cuz kind of goes beyond the scope of this particular course, but uh, here's our class server, and uh, we're going to have a string, and the data that we're going to have is, a, let's test if we can connect. Is a, is a, it's going to be this text string that we're going to send. So we're going to try, we're going to create a server socket, and we're going to call it server underscore socket. It's going to be a new server socket. It's going to be on port one, two, three, four. And then we're going to have uh, something printed to the screen. It says, I've started. Dear clients, come and connect to me. And then we're going to have a, a socket that's created for the, for the server that's going to say accept, which means it's sitting there now waiting for incoming connections to come in. So it'll say a server has connected and gets printed to the screen on the server. You can actually mimic this by taking this, compiling it, and putting it in a DOS console window and typing in, you make you know, Java space server, run the server, and the stuff will actually print to the screen and the stuff will actually run for you. We need a print writer output to client, new print writer. It's going to be a socket get output stream from the socket. Um, and it's going to be a print writer class instance to print out whatever the client sends to the server will be printed out on the server's console window. So we can see if a, con a connection has been created. Now we're going to send the stream. So it's going to be sending this data, which was up here. This I've started. Oh, it's up here. Let's test the connection or string data out to client, which is our print writer object, out to client, which is our new print writer, and this is part of the I.O. stuff that we uh, covered a couple weeks ago. And dot print data, so it will automatically print from, and this is because we're running it from the socket output stream. It will print to the socket output stream, this string, this test, let's test the connection, and then it's going to close it, and then it's going to close the server, it's going to close it. So essentially what we're going to do is, uh, oops, I didn't work. This is a, if an exception was caught. So essentially, the server's going to start up. It's going to print, hey, I'm here, ready to go, and then send, a, send something to the client if the client actually uh, connects. 
And here's our client code. <coughs> and I didn't go over the top here, but it's it's fairly simple. You want to include the I/O. You want to include the .NET. Class client. Class client is going to cr create a socket. It's going to be a new socket on localhost one two three four. And uh, we're going to because we're going to connect to the same port. And uh, I think I basically told you the wrong thing. We want to. No, actually I didn't. But this is the port of the host. This is the port of the server that we're connecting to. And the server is on one two three four. And it's on localhost. So we get the port of the server, and we've got the address of the server. This is shorthand for the localhost, which is on the same computer. You can use this actually, and it'll work. So which means you don't have to actually put in the IP address or the domain name or the host name of your actual server. So we're going to do a buffer reader on this one. We're going to go to in from server, and we're going to create a new <coughs> buffer reader that's going to get the socket get input. So it's going to say uh, receive string is going to be printed to the screen, and while in from server ready, while we're waiting essentially to get something from the server, the server is going to send something. When it sends something, we're going to read it, we're going to close it, and then we're going to print it to the screen, essentially. So we're going to system out. Actually, we don't even system out. Oh, here it is. We're going to system out it right here. When we get it in, we're going to system out it. We're going to in dot read line, read one line of output and actually print it to the screen at the same time. So what this does is that it, while the server's there, it's going to essentially wait for a client. Client connects, and then the client is going to ask for this by going, I'm ready. It's going to ask for whatever the server has to offer it. The server's going to send it to it. The server's going to close. The client's going to close. So it's pretty simple, pretty basic. You can cut and paste this code here, or type it in and uh, put it into a uh, put it into a couple of Java files. Compile it. Open up two DOS console windows. Make up a port number because everything's open within your computer itself. You don't have to worry about anything being blocked. Use localhost actually. Localhost should work just fine, and it should work. And here's how. Actually, here's the DOS console windows for you. So the simple server and the client pair. What happens with the screen? What happens on the screen if you run the code? Well, this is going to happen. First, you run the server, and uh, the server is up uh, here. Here's Java server up here. Then you run the client, and uh, basically, this is a visual of what I just told you a few minutes ago uh, in terms of what's going to happen. You know, it's going to if if the Java if, if the clients if the server is not running and you run the client, it's not going to run because it's not going to connect to anything, so it didn't work. Otherwise, it's going to receive the message. And if we run, so we have to run the client. We have to run the server first. If we run the server first and run the client, then we're going to get essentially the output that we want. So it's a kind of a coordination between the client and the server that has to be considered. These are simple server client and pair. If you run the dot Java without running the dot the, the client dot Java without running the server, it's going to say. Uh, you know, oops, it didn't work. Obviously, it's not going to work. So. Well, obviously, if you don't have a program to connect to, the socket's useless. <laughs> so. You can um, create, and here's our, my UDP stuff, you can create, as a side note before I continue, you can create uh, instant messaging programs this way. You know, can, on, on, in fact, in the old days, uh, especially under Novell, there was a lot of really cool, like, little utilities where if you were all on the same network, you can pop up a little window and ping somebody, send a message to someone, hey, how you doing? All you need to, all you needed to know was the person's host name and uh, the port. And you just use that information, you could send it. And then it was built into like these nice little user interfaces. And then along came text mess uh, along came instant messaging, like Yahoo messaging and MSN messaging. And then. That actually is, is kind of different because you're working with a common server. So all your clients, and this can be done. Through TCP. This is done through TCP IP, by the way. The reason why instant messaging was a problem is because it uses sockets and ports. And it required that you open up ports. So what, what ended up happening is you were, in fact, this is one of the earlier problems of Microsoft Windows and Windows 95 and 98. There was a huge big issue with Microsoft networking, that instant messaging program. And then a lot of people just started uninstalling it immediately. Because what it did is it opened up ports. Because you needed to open the port, you had to take the security off the firewall off the port so that you could send and receive through the port and other people could send and receive. Well, could you imagine the security vulnerability that creates? <laughs> so, 
So now if you go into a company setting and you install instant messaging, it's always going to mess up with a port. It's always going to use a port. So a lot of companies have restricted that completely because a lot of office environments don't want that vulnerability. You'll actually, depending upon your fair use policy, if you install something like that on your computer without authorization of the company, you probably will end up getting fired these days. But in the old days, people really didn't think about it. They just did it all the time. Oh, well, yeah, instant messaging. We like that. You know, then the people would sit at their desk and instant message back and forth. And it's using this technology. It's using sockets and ports. So now it doesn't, it doesn't go peer-to-peer -peer these days. It goes to a common server. So you can actually create your own instant messaging program using Java quite easily. So put your server together <laughs> and then have your clients connect to your server. And your server is, is going to be nothing more than an exchange host. It takes a message from one client and delivers it to another client. It takes a message from one client and delivers it to another client. That way you can have this common server location that's in between all the clients. And you, don't, you can keep a list, you know, actually just like Yahoo, of all your clients that you're doing and the server is going to basically be the traffic cop between all the connections and it's using sockets and ports. Essentially same concept. I mentioned earlier on when I talked about TCP, I also mentioned the concept of UDP or datagrams. UDP protocol provides a mode of network communication whereby datagrams are sent over the network a datagram. We have a datagram socket that is used for this connection. So instead of a server socket, instead of a server, excuse me, a socket by the generic TCP connection, we talk about datagrams because UDP is a datagram protocol and the datagram protocol is nothing more than a packet, if you want to think of it that way. It's a bit, bit of a piece of information, kind of like an email message, but not to be confused with email, there's a different protocol for that. You can actually use that in Java as well. Uh, but long story short, datagram has arrival time, has an arrival order, and the arrival is not guaranteed. It's unreliable, so there's no constant connection. Um, so it's used whenever an information needs to be broadcast periodically. So you can send datagrams out to all clients, all servers. You can send a datagram to a server, and then when the server wants to get it, the server gets it, hopefully. There's no um, synchronization. If you uh, follow through the logic of this, if the server's not up and the client sends it, the client's going to get a message. You know, hey, oops, sorry, no connection. Can't connect. In a datagram packet, you're not going to get anything like that at all. UDP, you're going to get, you know, here's, here's a UDP example, actually. You're going to get, well, we uh, tried to connect, and we're going to assume we connected, okay, and we we're going to send it, we're going to hopefully it made it, but there's no guarantee that it's going to make it. So UDP and TCP can be used in a very similar manner, and uh, where we have on the UDP, we're also going to use .NET, so it, it, Java.NET, the same package. And here we have a class that we're going to call uh, get date, and uh, it's essentially going to be a datagram socket. So we're going to have a port date time, which is going to be essentially our uh, our port that we're going to access. We're going to it's an integer value that we're just going to add to this final static. I don't know why. Probably further down, it's uh, going to be used, but um, it's a class level data member that was created when using this static. And we're going to use a main void, and we're going to have a datagram socket, dg socket equals new datagram socket. And uh, the internet address address is going to be equal to, and we're going to basically create the datagram socket to this get name, this, this particular news feed that's going to be on this Ohio State. Um, the OSU, I guess OSU is Oregon State, uh, Ohio State University instead of Oregon State. No. We'll just make up names today. So... Uh, it's going to be bound to a URL, essentially. And then we're going to say a datagram packet. The packet's going to have some bytes in it. And the bytes are going to be what we're going to be reading. So we have a message that we're going to send. The message has a length and it has a destination and it has a port. This is our port number that we're going to use up here, which is going to be an integer value. So over here we can say send this datagram. So on this object that we created that was a datagram object, a datagram socket object, we say send this datagram. Very similar to sending and receiving with the TCP objects. Datagram is equal to new datagram, and here's the message and the message length. We have to give it the length because we need to know how long, how many bytes they're supposed to get. Although there is no error checking, it knows to read to a certain point. It does. There's no end of line or end of file kind of indicator. So the length is what tells us, you know, I'm sending you five bytes. Here they are. 
and so the server can go here. Where are my five bytes? Here they are. One, two, three, four, five. And so it knows what it's getting. And so it can also receive. So here we have the datagram socket receive datagram. We're going to print something to the screen. We're going to get the data. We're going to say uh, time of the machine plus receive and received object. Here's a string that we're getting from the data. Gram dot get data. And we're going to close it. So if we run it, it prints out to the screen uh, time of machine Tuesday. Blah 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 blah. It's getting. It's actually going to give us. Uh, a time that's going to come back via the UDP. So the synchronization between the server and the client is less important because we're using simple data that's being sent, passed back and forth. Um, different issues, uh, different applications, different uses. You're going to decide if you're going to use UDP or TCP depending upon the type of application. Um, if you want to support a lot of simultaneously connected clients, and it's going to be something in this particular case, to go get a date, as an example, do you really need a constant connection? Nope. Because you're not going to connect to a server and say, can you find me this file? And the server's going to look around for this file and send it back to you. And then maybe find you another file and send it back to you, find another. If you're going to have multiple transactions going on, you're going to use TCP. If you're going to have one at a time transaction, or in this particular case, getting a date, as an example. And uh, then, obviously, the code's not here. For the, it's code is incomplete on this one, but... Uh, you uh, can definitely pick the protocol for the application nature that you're going to use. So. Supplemental reading if you want to learn a little bit more about the sockets. None of the assignments for this course have to do with sockets, so you're lucky on that. No network programming, but it wouldn't be a Java course without network programming, as a, at least as an introduction. These links still work. Not bad. Of course, they're all on the Oracle server instead of Sun, but uh, the URLs actually work. So. All right, so what I have for you are some examples. And the examples, just so you know where to get them from, is out here, lecture eight and nine examples from, let me just go through the steps here. If I go back to uh, object-oriented programming with Java, and I go down to the course materials link, and a course materials, and if I go down to this part here where it says lecture examples. This is where all the lecture examples are located, by the way. The last but not least is lecture number eight and number nine examples. If I download the examples, which I have already, I get these two files. Only two files in there. So you're going to want to create a project for it, and I've done that in Eclipse here. Oops. Most people are wondering well, how do I create a project in Eclipse? Well, let me just do it real quick here so you see it. New Java project. Actually, you know, I should probably make this a little bigger so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to put here uh, URL examples. And I'm going to go finish. And if I come up here, I get a URL examples project, and the project is going to be empty. Nothing in the project, nothing in the source directory. So if I right mouse click and I go import, and I go to the file system here by default. And I go next. And I believe I put it on my desktop, hopefully. I did. Desktop. JP 8 and 9 was what it was called. And I say open. You want to have both. You want to take, I don't need this one. You want to have both of these two files because they both work together, which is kind of like why I'm doing this to show you. <laughs> you need to put both of these in the same package because the text editor GUI is going to use the URL get. Because it's going to be a text editor, just like what we saw last time. And you have a text editor as one of your assignments, by the way. Uh, this is going to be a nice text editor with buttons and stuff. This is going to look cool. Um, but we need this to work with the text editor. So, finish. Now, if I come over here, let me close this guy for a second. Now I have an Eclipse project that's created with these two files. In my default package. So let's take a look at this code over here because this is the new stuff. What do we have? This is going to be a get. This is a class that we've created called get URL get. Let me get a little bigger so you can see it. And uh, lo and behold, no surprise, it's using java.net and java.io. We need the IO for the input stream, output stream. We need the .net for the URL. So 
What this class is doing is it goes out and gets information and puts it into a stream and that's it. <laughs> so it's common to see the application broken out this way. Put the functionality into separate classes. It's very common to see people do it the other way and make one like web browser. And I didn't really, I didn't purpose, I purposely did not make a web browser, but you could make a web browser and put everything all inside the web browser code. It's like one object. And then you can't change anything. You can't modify anything. So for modularity purposes, it's kind of not a bad idea to separate out the functionality. Just in case this is broken, then you can kind of figure out, well, what's wrong with this? Without having to go through all of the source code for the entire project. So it's a separate class. I'm going to call it URL get. And we're going to have a get site. And it's going to take a string. And the string is actually going to come from our GUI that we're going to see in the other the, the, the class that's going to make an instance of this. And now we have a string builder, SP, that's going to be equal to new string builder. And here we go. This is, our, this is our, our complicated, not really complicated, our easy to go code. We're going to say we're going to do a try, we're going to do a while. If you remember the try and the catch from the IO exceptions I gave you a couple weeks ago, it's going to implement that as well. Because we want to, we want to make sure we have a proper URL. So the URL is going to say uh, try URL connection connection. Okay, new going to create a new URL, URL, open connection. So we're going to, it's of the URL, oops, let me go back this way. The open connection is going to open connection for the URL that we've specified, and the URL that we specified is a string that we're going to get from a get site um, that we're going to, we're going to use from an, another GUI. So if we put the string, if we don't hard set the string, and this is another kind of design thing to tell you about, you can change the string easily. If you hard set the string, then it's really hard to change it inside of the object. So it's common to see some, you know, get site, get URL type of method that you're going to run on an instance of this object that's going to basically, you know, take a string as a parameter, and here it is. So we can instantly change the URL without having to hard code it, compile it every time we want to change the URL. Um, we have a buffer reader. Reader is going to be a little new buffer reader. is going to be the input reader on the connection, and the connection is going to be a get input stream. No mystery. So. And this is a this is this is fairly standard. Uh, so let's see. While the reader dot ready, that's ready. SB, which is our string builder object, read the line. So it gets the information, reads the stuff in, puts it in the uh, SB object, which is going to be our string builder. And then uh, close it. Reader close. Close the connection. So we established the connection with the URL. We opened it. We read it into a string builder object. And we closed the connection. So that's really all this functionality is doing. And then we have our error checking at the bottom. It says, well, if it's malformed, to give us this message. If there's an IO exception, give it that message. In our main, we're going to throw an unsupported encoding exception meaning we can't read it, it's not text. You know, if it can't if it can't if it's like some binary file and not a text file. And then essentially we're gonna say uh, we're gonna we're gonna test it out in here. So it says get URL get test is equal to new URL get. So we're gonna create an instance of the object. Then I mean, you can run main actually. In fact we'll do it. I'll I'll run this one. And then I can also run this from the other other class file that I'm gonna uh, show you as well. The buffer writer uh, writer is equal to new buffer writer. The output stream is going to be, you know, uh, labcast.xml. It's going to load it, look, basically create it into a file. So it's going to take a, create an output stream for us and call it this. Uh, actually, let's just go test. There we go. And then, uh, oh, you know what? I probably shouldn't have done that. Uh, anyway, well, anyway. Um, we're going to get the right, okay, actually I'm actually going to take bhacker.com and write it into test.xml and then close the connection. So if I do this, let's just see what happens actually. You know what, I'm not going to save it though. I'm going to close, but I'm not going to save it. Uh, eh, I'll save it. Save it, yeah. Why not? I'm I was hesitating only because, uh, there's another application that works with this. I want to make sure the name's correct. <laughs> but, so I'm running this application and it didn't really do anything. It doesn't look like it did anything. If I go out here and oops, I'm not gonna be here either. 
Well, I don't know where the file was written to. It should have written it out to that file. Um, let me just close this stuff down and see if it's on my desktop somewhere. Nope. Oh, you know what's going to be in the work? It's going to be in the project directory of Eclipse. Let me find that real quick. Okay, so let's see. I'll just take a few minutes to see if I can locate it. If I can't, uh, it's going to be in my workspaces. Where my workspaces are? Yep, oh, workspace. There it is. Uh, what was this thing called? It was called uh, URL examples. There it is. And this is uh, test.xml. It what happened with this program when I ran it is it went out to behacker.com, took all the stuff, put it in an input stream, and wrote it out to test.xml. If I double click on test.xml, I see the source code. If I wanted to actually see it correctly, I could change the extension. It's really an HTML file, not an XML file. And uh, now it should be related to my web browser. There it is. Well, it doesn't look as pretty because it didn't download all the images and stuff. But that's the text that it got. So it's a quick, dirty, I shouldn't say dirty, quick and easy way of going in uh, to a program. You know, with inside of the program, we didn't, we didn't have any impression that anything happened. Instead, it just went to a URL. It could have downloaded a text file that it could have had XML information in it. It could have been used for processing orders. Let's say for a shopping cart. It could have been used for processing information, getting information. Um, you know, actually, in, in all honesty, it probably could be used for something that's cookie oriented, you know, or session related. Some data in terms of what did this guy, you know, what did this guy purchase, or what do you know? It just could be information that's stored on the server. And the server is giving it to the client, and it's getting it through that URL. So you can possibly, you know, come up with a some imaginative, imaginative, you know, use your imagination, come up with some examples of how you could use that in an application. It's quite easy as long as that site's up. If the site's not up, you're going to get an error message that comes back and says, "Hey, not up." But nice little way of, of showing you how to get something from a URL and copy it to a file. All right, so let's use it in a text editor. So if I open up this guy here and uh, I have a text editor that's going to allow me to bring something in from a URL just the same as I did before and look at it in a window and allow me to change it and save it maybe. Um, so it's going to be text editor GUI that extends Java Swing JFrame and uh, if you remember last time we also have J file chooser this is the same but a different text editor and you may use this code as well if you need it for uh, that uh, last assignment that we had that we're doing a text editor. In fact, I gave you a lot of code already for that as well. But here's another, yet another example. It's actually kind of the same, um, so I don't really have to go through it that much. We're going to have a file. It's going to be a file, no name, or, you know, just a basic file. We're going to have as a starter point. Create the new text editor GUI. Well, create the text editor GUI here. This is the text editor GUI. Make a new instance of it initialize the components. If we initialize the components of it, which is kind of interesting, what we're doing is we're creating an instance of it with a copy button, a JPanel button, and what we're doing is, what I'm doing here in this initialize component is kind of showing you how you can just create a bunch of stuff in a GUI, you know, call it init, init components, put all your stuff together in one location so it's easier to find, easier to modify. These are going to be a bunch of buttons, a J button, a J scroll, another button here, a cut button, a paste button. So it's going to give you a more sophisticated looking, same functionality, but more sophisticated looking text editor. Actually, I don't think we had a cut and a paste in our last text editor. I think we just had a, I think it just opened up the file basically and it allowed us to save it because that's all it really did. And you were changing the foreground and the background color, the text color and stuff. So set the default uh, close operation, close on exit, uh, set the title, the Java text editor, set the name, it's going to be the main frame name. We don't actually need that comment in here because it's different, different usage. I pulled it out. Uh, so copy button is going to be a text, uh, set the text to copy on the copy button. Anyway, you can go through this and see how all these buttons are popular. We have the paste, the paste button, the cut button. So we're basically defining all of the parameters for all of these buttons that you're going to see on the screen in a few minutes. And we're going to load the menu. There's going to be a J menu on here. We've got J menu 1 that we're going to load, J menu 2, a couple of menu bars that are going to show up. 
they're going to be populated with the buttons. And we're going to nest it together in terms of uh, how we looked at last time, in terms of the components and putting them in their frame. We're going to group them all. Here's our nesting, actually, right here. All right, we're going to use a group layout for this. And we're going to set the layout to the component pane. And we're going to add the stuff to the layout, add the layout to the pane, add the pane to the frame. Kind of, you know, nest it all together. And then at the very end, we're going to pack it. So you'll, this is, a, again, a kind of a review from last time. If, uh, if you missed that lecture, go back and look at that, and I'll go through in a lot more detail, a lot slower. I just scrolled through a few minutes ago. Or download the assignment, or download the example, I should say, and play with it yourself. Pack's going to be at the end uh, to put it all together to make it all seamlessly show up all at the same time. And then, again, we have our functionality for our copy button action performed. So when the event-driven behavior is performed, when the event of the button click is registered, uh, with the event listener, it's going to populate, uh, it's going to, uh, excuse me, perform this functionality to populate the screen to give us our functionality. Uh, so last but not least, down here at the bottom, we should, here it is, here it is, we have a URL box. This is where we're going to use the URL, URL test is going to be equal to a new, and this is, this is the part I really wanted just to show you is this new object that we're creating, our URL get, which is our URL get right here. This is that other object that we created uh, that I just showed you a few minutes ago. And it's going to, this one is a self-contained kind of thing. All it does is get and writes it to the file. But we don't really need it to the file. Instead, what we're going to do is going to take the string URL and have it equal to the URL test field dot get text. So we're going to put a string out in a text box on the menu somewhere. You know, kind of like a web browser. Take that URL, use it as the URL, essentially. Apply it here, and, and then set it to go get it. And so what we're going to do is get, get site URL. So this is essentially a method that's being run from this particular object that's going to do the same identical thing we just saw a few minutes ago. But it's going to take the file, and it's going to load it up into the web browser. I believe, I just want to make sure, because I changed the name, I don't believe it's loading the file itself. Instead of loading the file, I believe it should be loading the output stream. If not, I'll change that file name back. But uh, let me just take a quick look here, refresh my memory. No, it should just be getting... Uh, Ah, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. No, we're good. We're good. Okay, good. So, and then the rest of this is the main method that's going to essentially put everything together for us and uh, set the stage. So let, let's just run this and uh, I'll see if I have to change anything on it. Here's our text editor. Let me minimize this so it makes it easier to see it. When I ran the project, this is what I'm getting. If I go here, oh, good, so it didn't matter. This is the text that is also part of that file, so if I change the URL, so I want to see what Google looks like. It's going to bring in the text that's at google.com. Hmm. Pretty boring looking text. It doesn't really do anything. But you can kind of see how I've taken, it gets the text from the text box, applies it to the get URL object in that method, retrieves, and this button action is going to basically um, retrieve the information for us and display it out here. So our text editor actually has uh, some more functionality to it. It's just example text, so hello world. Um, let's see. Yeah, functionality works. You might want to play around with this if you're looking to create your own text editor. What you would probably have to do with this as well, and unless you wanted to see the code, uh, which is kind of interesting. You're probably not going to want to see the code. You're probably going to want to see this translated. What you have to do is make another class object, and the other class object is a translation that takes and reads the HTML tags from document type HTML. And there's a, a lot of third-party actual Java utility classes already made for you. You can probably find one on the internet. 
find one of those or build one yourself that parses. The only problem with building it yourself is you have to know all of the HTML tags. <laughs> you have to basically reinvent the wheel. So I, I would just find a third party, you know, someone who's put together one of these things already, that takes a text file and converts it. Because what you have here is a text file. So it takes the text file, converts it from HTML to plain text, you know, applies the formatting for you so that it appears like, and then voila, you've got yourself a web browser. That is a, what a web browser is doing. Um, the other thing a web browser is doing, however, that you may not be doing in this particular example uh, would be applying plugins. So you would get a web browser, you'd, you'd actually be able to create your own web browser but you wouldn't be able to use Flash or any of the Adobe or any of the other plugins that are there unless you built the support for the plugins. If you're going to go that far, if you, you know, as a simple web browser for just text, for searching and stuff, that might actually be a nice application. But if you're, gonna, if you're thinking about doing the plugins, I'd look for source code examples for the plugins, which is not actually that bad because it's kind of the same concept except you have to put in the proprietary information and the code for the plugin usage which again that you know if you've ever noticed how many mistakes Firefox makes <laughs> in Internet Explorer it's a challenge I don't know if I would bother doing that I think I would just use Firefox or <laughs> Internet Explorer if that were the case but if you wanted to play around with the functionality you know if, if you have an interest in it you know it definitely I would say it would not be too hard to put together your own simple web browser if you wanted to. Embed it in a text editor so you can browse for stuff while you're writing a paper or something. Who knows? So that is what I had to show you today. Um, and that is essentially um, the, you know, the networking features, the basic networking features. Well, what I didn't cover was uh, FTP, Telnet capabilities, um, other higher end, which is more manually done in Java. This is more the automated, make a socket, you know, make a socket object, make a URL object, and run the connection on it. Um, I would, if you have an interest in that, I would take a course in, uh, in web development or in uh, Java development. And if you're going to do that, what you're going to end up doing is you're probably not going to be using sockets for that. As I mentioned earlier in the lecture, there's this thing called RMI. There's Java Beans or Servlets, uh, which is all part of what's called Java Enterprise Edition, which is the EE edition of Java. Um, I'm hoping I'm going to teach this class very soon, and I do, because I haven't ever taught it here before, and it's actually it's more powerful than the socket stuff. I mean, the basic socket networking is okay, but to be able to put together more efficient networking is a lot better. And as an example, the Servlet technology works with beans, Java beans, which are nothing more than, it's all written in Java, it's the same language you know already. And they're just small little programs that do basic functionality. And the servlets are just small, you know, client server slash distributed server implementations of objects. RMI is essentially the same thing as Java except, um, you know, when you go to a server and you have something run on the server in a regular client server environment, especially in the socket stuff we just looked at, each client has its own instance created and on the server there's a it runs its own file and stuff like that and a um, RMI the remote method invocation is essentially what that stands for and it's because a client can go to the server and use the same invoked object that another client is using so the server only has one instance of every object that it's hosting up created instead of one instance for each client that connects to it because as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, what really affects the performance of this client-server environment is how many clients are connected to the server and how many clients can the server support. And if the server can't support simultaneous clients, then you're, you know, it's going to affect the performance of the entire application. So RMI is a, an attempt to make it, well, it's a good attempt, actually. It's a successful attempt <laughs> to make it very efficient. So the server only has one instance of one object that's served up and then there's a there's a manager that sits there and says oh you want this object okay and they the objects are shared the objects are invoked remotely so 
It's just like when you run the JVM and you run Java on your local computer, on your on your client computer, you're remote. You're not remote, you're local. So you're locally invoking objects in your JVM, your Java virtual machine. So RMA allows you to remotely invoke objects that are on a server instead of being on your local machine. So it really does create a more distributed computing environment. It creates a lot more efficiency. The server can run faster, it doesn't have to serve up as much. It's more efficient than the old client server model of sockets. So but sockets do have, you know, as I showed you today, sockets do have a purpose for sending and receiving, for instant messaging, for you know, simple URL tasks and stuff like that. It's it's fun to be able to do something like that. And this is lightweight. When you work with RMI, you're installing an RMI server <laughs> component and you're you're, there's a lot more to it. It's more involved than creating a simple socket and sending and receiving. So, All right, I'll leave you with that. And uh, hopefully in the future I'll be teaching the RMI class here. <laughs> I want to. So we'll see what happens with that. And uh, that's all for today. Unless you have questions, comments, or concerns. Nope, we're done. See you next time. You guys all know all the assignments are due on the 12th? Do you know the final exam is on the 14th? Yeah. Do you know, what else do you know? What else you don't know? I don't know. We can write it on the 14th. You can write it on the 12th or the 14th. 12th or 14th. Yeah. 12th or 14th. What day is the 30th? All right, hold on. Let me shut this. These guys don't need to listen to this. Let me shut